Can everybody hear me okay? Do the whole Joe Rogan thing, you know, the whole mic for this. You guys watch the Joe Rogan podcast. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, thank you to the sponsors. My favorite sponsor up here is probably No Stars Press. So, if Bill ever watches this, thank you for all the quality content. Those books are awesome. I probably spend a lot of money on those every year. My wife doesn't appreciate that. So, getting started, this talk is called Building a Cult Culture of Security. How to utilize deals and resources are nil. And notice I highlighted cults because basically this is going to teach you how to build a cult. This is my informal title to my talk. Any talk that I do, I, in, I add an informal title. And I'm going to take this information and teach you how to build your own cult organization. If you don't know me, uh, I'm a cybersecurity engineer for Carfax. Uh, I do have quite a few hobbies. So if I'm not doing security research or working, I'm probably living in the gym. I'm doing weights or I'm probably in the gym and doing jiu jitsu. Uh, if I'm not doing that, I'm spending time with my family, and I also do a little bit of research right now. It's been really focused on reconnaissance research right now. But I also do serve part-time in Missouri Air National Guard, where I also do cybersecurity, but it's more of like information concerns, policy, and paperwork, because I truly don't like myself. Uh, for all you GRC people out there. For those of you who expected like a technical talk, this is not a technical talk. This is more focused on people and less of tech. But for those of you, oh yeah, also, this kind of falls in line with what uh, Aaron Scanlon, he has a really good talk on how we're doing IT wrong. So I highly recommend you talk to him because this kind of correlates with that and kind of helps solve some of these issues that he presents. But for those of you that need kind of that tech hitter, maybe that afternoon wool, uh, I got something for you. So this is Shodan. This is a uh, water tank found here in the city of Kansas City. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, but uh, that's an ICS system connected to the internet. You may want to notify that person or team. Uh, that is connected because that probably shouldn't be. Cool, so let's go ahead and set the scene from the script you guys probably read. Um, you might have a small team. You may have limited resources with the budget to uh, link. You may have you know, limited number of assets or people to cover on your security team. Also, as security folks, we don't know everything. You know, we might be uh, structured in either development security, penetration testing, and response administration. And then the so-called talent shortage. You know, they keep saying we have a talent shortage in InfoSec, whether you agree with it or not. Um, but these are the resources, this is kind of the scene that maybe a lot of you are dealing with. I know I deal with it in my job, and maybe you guys deal with it as well. So exactly what do you do about that? Well, you can be like Ron Swanson and just give up on humanity, go and throw your computer away, and move out to the middle of nowhere. Or you can be like every other cybersecurity analyst or engineer saying, hey, I'm going to quit cybersecurity, I'm going to go start my regenerator farm and just live off the grid. I don't know why it seems like that everybody wants to just be a farmer after this job. And I don't know, I want to do the same thing. But you can also use uh, scale to scale your security team and your knowledge using a guild. And you're probably thinking, what in the FF is a guild? Well, the WTFF, first of all, came from my daughter. She said, hey, Dad, do you know what WTFF means? I'm like, I hope she, I didn't teach her that. And she said, yeah, it's what the French fry. I'm like, okay, whew, good context. Anyways, uh, a guild is not a guild three game. We all probably played back in the day. I never played it. I was more of a RuneScape guy myself, part of the Legends Guild. Anybody here play RuneScape? All right, three nerds, four nerds in here, great, awesome. But if you're part of Legends Guild, that's kind of what it is. It's like an inclusive group. You have a sort, sort, of, or a sort of set of skills, knowledge, whatever it is to be a part of that. So uh, what does it mean for InfoSec and technology in the So a guild was actually coined by Spotify. It's an agile concept that can actually spread knowledge, information, best practices, code. Um, and the main purpose of it was during Spotify's growth, they had massive growth when they started. I think they went from like 20 employees to 350 within a year time span. And so they said, we need to scale this growth with people. We need to have some coverage. So what they did was they utilized a skilled concept to actually address that massive spike of growth. You know, in the context for security, we're gonna be calling a guild member a security champion. And now it's not what you think, it's not a hacker with a hoodie holding the trophy up, but really it's somebody who kind of has that knowledge of tools and the code and the best practices that you train them on. So the security champion can be one or two or multiple people of one team or one product that you can take and train on and give them the proper skills and tooling and what have you to kind of bring them up to that level one security spot. This is a, a graphic of what Spotify did. Again, they call them tribes, I and mean, whatever cultish word you want to use, you can use uh, whatever one. But they took you know, four people from each tribe, and they went ahead and made them part of whatever guild. It could be architecture, it could be 
cloud, it could be security, uh, it could be the food services deal, whatever deal they wanted to develop, that's how they did it. So how did I structure our deal at Carfax? Well, we have over 16 development teams, we have an old infrastructure team, and they have sub-teams. So we have from automation to the Windows team to the Linux team. Uh, you also have the administration, so general departments like finance, HR, a lot of those legal. And so what I did was, on the development side, I took one to two developers who had an interest in security. So I just gave the entire audience I asked, I said, who's interested in security? So I went ahead and wrote them down. And then I talked to some managers about who are some more security-oriented people as in getting security stuff done. And I made them a part of the security guild. On the infrastructure team, they actually opened this, uh, they embraced this idea because they wanted their people involved into that security guild. So we have a whole host of infrastructure people in our guild right now. And then we took some people from you know, the admin department, so such as finance and legal and HR, and kind of made them the technical POCs. And we, have, we compiled the security guild. So the very first step, uh, once you have a guild organized, and this is how you kind of build a cult, or the culture of security is that you have to take extreme ownership. And before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about the Colonial Pipeline breach. Do we all know about that? Everybody raise your hands if you know about it. Okay, some of you did raise your hand. So there's this group, uh, Dark Side. I think they're nation state actors, but they compromise the users' credentials. And they're able to log into one of the Colonial Pipeline systems, and they were able to deploy ransomware using those credentials. So if you guys didn't watch the news, um, Colonial Pipeline actually paid off a ransom to, to get the encryption key. They didn't have the proper backups or the other security controls in place. So uh, not with just that supply breach or supply chain breach, but there's going to be many more happening. There was one that happened in Iowa earlier in the week, and there's another one happening. So uh, all this stuff's not going to slow down. But the thing I want to focus on is who was at fault? Uh, was it the users? Was it the developers? Was it networking? Did networking fall here, or was it security? How many people work in security? Just raise your hand. Okay, we got one, two. Well, I got news for you. We're all at fault. That's our fault. That's, that's extreme ownership. We failed the company. Now, some of you are thinking, like, you know, that's, that's not the case. You know, I don't work there. You know, or people advised them and told them to write our own thing. But in order to take extreme ownership, you have to accept the fault for those issues. So any security exploit issue vulnerability is going to be our fault, not their fault. It's our fault. And it's usually a failure of user education, uh, access to tooling, anything that we can offer the organization, we either not communicate the right or we're not training them on it. And we're also not holding people accountable too, so that kind of falls into it. Uh, you, got that, you have to implement some sort of decentralized command. And so it's really impossible for us to know everything, and that's where we lean on the people who are on the front lines. So when I say front lines, I'll talk a lot of military terms, but the people who are doing like the code, like developers are writing code every day. They're gonna know a better process and they implement like security scanning into a CIC pipeline than anybody else. I can talk a little bit of code here and there, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have that expertise. And uh, back in 2015, I took a SANS class with John Strand. Uh, 504 was one of the greatest classes I've ever taken. But he said, you know, people are the biggest liability, but they're not leading to your greatest defense. So if you, you can utilize them to defend your organization through training and education, I think that's going to be the biggest defense and the biggest return on investment. Uh, yeah, so Alyssa Miller, she tweeted this uh, on September 20th, so not too long ago, and this really stuck with me. And for those who don't know, you can't say, I'm not going to read the whole tweet, but uh, she's basically saying that you know, users are not dumb, developers are not lazy, and that executives are not inherently dismissive. And it's really on us that we can't influence that behavior. Uh, to actually make InfoSec better and make our organization stronger. And that, that just kind of like stuck with me and I just really wanted to put this and do the mic drop because that, that's really a mic drop tweet for me and I've seen this in my organization using guilds. So step two in building a cult or culture of security, you have to give it some sort of purpose. And what do I mean that? Well, if you're going to have, you're going to put the resources, the time, the money, the people into it, you're going to have to have the purpose of it of that guild, in order to do that, you're going to need top-down buy-in. And so, when I was structuring our guild, and I actually proposed this idea up to upper management and, and you know, the executive suite, you know, I, I said, this is going to be the purpose of it, this is going to help us augment security, and this is going to help us actually scale security through people. They said, okay, well, we'll go ahead and do it, go ahead and meet the directors and the managers, and we'll see what we can do. And so I got buy-in from the directors, managers, and even people on board, or down below, on the front lines, so the developers, 
the infrastructure people, and also the admins. And then from that, um, you have to go and organize. Like you can't go in just saying, I'm gonna start a guild, these one or two people are in, we're gonna go ahead and move forward. But you have to kind of put together some sort of document, some sort of like charter. And I, you have to have predefined goals, such as like a mission statement, uh, what is the purpose, you know, what are they called, what are they doing? And I think the uh, most important thing here is uh, what benefits that will they have, you know, but input on certain POCs, you know, they can influence the security posture of the organization. And so I think out of all those, uh, describing the benefits to those members is probably going to be the best key on organizing your own guild. And also have fun with it, you know, give the group a name. Uh, we called ours, uh, let me show you here. We called ours Foxhound because I'm a big Metal Gear nerd. I love Metal Gear Solid. It's one of my favorite games of all time. So this is the uh, Special Forces group. It's a video game for those that don't know. But this is the Special Forces group for the military that uh, Solid Snake was a part of. And so I want to call us Foxhound. So I sent this logo. I said, hey, marketing, can you design me something that's similar to this? And they said, yeah, sure, we can go ahead and do that. You know, it's pretty cool. It's a little less lethal than the knife hanging out of the mouth. And they told me they couldn't do that. But, you know, really, that logo is pretty cool and everybody liked it. So that's kind of, that's our security build logo. This is an example of the charter. So we have all the information that I put in there. We have a mission statement. We have a purpose. We have exactly what a security champion is, what they do as far as like triage, uh, as far as, you know, what their responsibilities are. Our weekly meeting cadence. So we actually meet every two weeks and we discuss certain topics depending on what's going on in the world at the time. Some sort of central communication place, whether that be an email distribution list, a Slack channel, or some sort of uh, centralized place where you guys can talk. And then also down here you can see we have the benefits of being a security champion. And this was really, uh, I think, key in selling it to people, is that they have input on what the organization looks like as far as security posture goes. They can actually bring in tools themselves if they would like. They can go ahead and bring in, you know, uh, threat modeling tool that they like and want to see it. And we also put them into like our, uh, our training pipeline. So if we have any conferences, if we have any trainings we want to come up, we'll go ahead and offer it to our security, security build members. <clears throat> so step three in building a cult or culture of security is training. So one of the things that we did, and I've been told that I'm crazy for doing, is I gave all of our security build members access to security tooling. So that goes from code scanning, that goes from vulnerability scanning, that goes from uh, you know, our local SIM, uh, EDR platform, FDR platform, anything you can think of that we touch, a security guild member has access to. Now they may have limited access, but they can do their job. We also train them up on certain tools that we use. So we have we gave them specific training. So for example, developers were using a code scanning tool, and we train them how to use it. We train them how to triage vulnerabilities. We train them, or we train them how to uh, analyze the reports. Same thing for infrastructure. You know, we had a Nessus, Nessus server that we allowed the infrastructure people to log in and run scans of their own. And then the administration, it was more like basic security training platforms, it's such as phishing. We, we allowed them to see what phishing emails were coming in on a daily basis, which was really nice. And then we kind of developed a training plan. This is just an example of what we execute for our training plans. And so they're different depending on the organization. So if you're a developer, you have different training plans than what an operations does, operations training than what the organization does. But if you notice one thing here, everybody's enrolled in one training plan across the board. And that's just because we want to cover you know, phishing and multi-factor authentication for everybody. You know, that shouldn't just be limited to one group or one organization. Everybody should be trained on that. But we, these are focused on the different types of job duties an employee will run into. And also a tech stack. You know, the developers, they do run about four or five different tech stacks, but we also train them on some security vulnerabilities and what tools can help them achieve their goal. So step four in building a cult or culture of security is measurement. And uh, metrics seems to be the most important thing of 2021, I think, moving forward, even for senior level, even for management level, and even at the uh, employee level. It seems like everybody wants to capture metrics. And it's also a good way to measure how you're doing, if what you're doing is effective. In order to capture those, you know, what we use, we use uh, vulnerability closures, we use code fixes, we also use the training passes and failures within our phishing program. So if 85% of the organization is passing, that's also a great score. If it's 10%, you know, that's a terrible score. We definitely don't want that. So, but also, are the security champions being proactive? 
do they have knowledge, uh, the knowledge that they can share across the team. So just because they're a security champion doesn't mean the knowledge, security knowledge stops with them. They have to propagate it across the organization or across the team. So uh, if you're training somebody on node vulnerabilities, you expect that entire team to know what the basic level of node vulnerabilities. You know, are they handling the extra responsibility? Uh, that's kind of a hard sell sometimes, but uh, a lot of the developers that I train, a lot of the infrastructure I train, they don't consider extra responsibility as, you know, we want to push security as everybody's responsibility. One of the things here is that, is the code getting fixed quicker or is it getting better? And you can capture those from your static analysis tool. Uh, whatever one you use, if you use number source one, you can capture those metrics. And then on us, you know, how can we give the developers or infrastructure better training or anything else to help them achieve their goals? How can we improve these metrics ourselves? Do they need more training on a certain language or are they looking at like GraphQL vulnerabilities? And again, capturing these metrics are important because this is one of the metrics we captured from our static analysis tool. So this was back in 2020-ish, maybe 2021, I can't remember which year, but we kind of introduced the security guild around this point right here. Uh, at an all-time high, so our code in the, uh, the blue bar represents like code flaws, you know, flaws per megabyte. So as we introduce the yield, we give the developers more uh, access to the tool, and you can tell, you can see the metrics went down. So our code flaws started to go down, even though our analysis stayed, you know, pretty stagnant for the most part. So we were able to kind of scale some of that level one and triage and code fixes uh, through the security guild on the development side, and it really did pay off for us. Yeah, but it really did pay off for us, even though that we kind of started small, we kind of grew organically. But it's definitely something that we uh, saw a lot of pay off then. Uh, this is deep, near to my heart. This is actually from uh, one of the engineering teams or operations teams. You guys don't know, there was a critical VMware vulnerability released this week. And before I was able to notify the team, this was in my DMs. And I was like, that's, that's pretty awesome. Thank you for going ahead and pushing, pushing forward with this. And this, again, this is on the infrastructure. Side. This is not limited to development. So they're able to catch that, they're going to start the patch, up, or patch process automatically, submit the change ticket, and move forward and get in that patch. They beat me to it, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, and again, so I was slow too, so this was another team that they had normal servers, a pretty nasty remote code execution vulnerability. And as you can tell in my DMs, that uh, it was already fixed before I even caught it. Now, shame on me for not getting it, but they, they had it already patched and ready to go. And that's that's kind of all those proud dad moments. You know, you get the Robert Redford meme and you just shake your head. Yeah, that's, that's a good job. So let's go ahead and take another technical break for those who like the technical stuff. Uh, this is a remote code execution vulnerability on Confluence servers. I can't remember what version is vulnerable to it. Uh, I was going to put that in here, but I forgot. But there is the POC script. All you need is Python. You can run that against the, your own Confluence server and see if you can execute any commands. And so this is this one's pretty important, togetherness and building your own cult or culture of security. And this means doing things together. And it, it's taking that extra step of building relationships with people. Uh, you know, from the bottom up, top down, manager to employee, get to know the people, get to know their interests. You know, what are they working on? Why is it important to them? Uh, what do they do outside of work is fun. Uh, it's kind of nice to kind of get to know what people do outside of work and what's outside of your work friends. And then establishing a cadence, uh, that's super important when you build a, a security build. Um, having to be, I think, more frequently in shorter talks, like 30 or 45 minutes, is probably more beneficial than having like a once a month meeting or once a quarter meeting where it's like two hours. So we do one from uh, every two weeks for about 30 to 45 minutes. And then we also train the teams outside of the guild meetings. So one team might be using GraphQL, we'll train them on the basic vulnerabilities from there. And we also send out a bunch of different like security conferences, trainings, stuff that we'll be going to uh, through our you know centralized communication channel. That could be a Slack channel, a private channel, or an email distribution list, or even like a group text. We do have group text where we keep the engagement up. And then again, we don't know everything as security professionals. Uh, is there a way we can automate some of the stuff that we're working on or they're working on? And we do have this in our security field. We have one team that's really good at automation. And they're actually helping other teams push this across the organization on how we can automate certain deployments based off the tech stack that they're using. And then we also have had a few um, people propose like security uh, best practices to leadership. When we're talking to C-level suite leadership. They're able to do presentations uh, over some of the stuff that they're working on and how it'll improve the security posture of the organization. 
As with anything, there are drawbacks to this. So the uh, best thing here is that security is simple. It's definitely not easy. It's still going to be hard at the end of the day, no matter what. Uh, this thing takes time. This was a two-year project that still grown organically to be effective. So I had to put the time to build your relationship, selling it to management, implementing it, start from a pilot group, growing to over 60 members. And it takes a little bit of time, takes a little bit of effort. And then you're still fighting the business. At the end of the day, we're all still fighting this business, security versus the business. And so you may not get full participation due to like what the uh, demand or work demand is because at the end of the day, security doesn't make money or a cost center. But if we can make it part of everybody's responsibility, I think we can actually help solve that. And then we also run into uh, of hiring new people and people go, sometimes we're teaching some of the same techniques and tools, and so it can get boring, but we try not to do that. We try to focus on outside training for that. And again, you may not have a good means of measuring performance yourself. Uh, just because I have some of these tools that I can show you, you guys may not have that, or some of your resources are small, but just capturing some sort of metric so you can measure to see what you're doing, whether that be closing out tickets or emails or messages, people are working on stuff, that could be a metric as well. These are some resources that I've used to kind of start our security guild. You know, just about four different books I read is Extreme Ownership by Jocko Babin. Same one, the, the dichotomy of leadership uh, by the same authors. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and uh, Meditation by Marcus Aurelius. And if you guys want to check out what Spotify did as far as like scaling their services using guilds, you can check out those two links as well. And go ahead and take some of this information, go ahead and make some Kool Aid. Other than that, that's in the presentation. I ran through that pretty quick, but I hope it's informative. And if you guys want to connect, those are all on my social. Thank you.